Hi, everyone. This is uh, welcome to Art for Your Game Without Breaking the Bank. Uh, the, uh, we're going to do some introductions and then I'll go by an outline and go over some topics, but feel free to text in any questions you may have anytime during the, the panel. Text them into Twitch. Okay, so my name is Jack Para. I uh, I do art for small press games and, and novels. Uh, I've done stuff for car games, uh, tabletop RPGs. Currently, I'm working on my third uh, kids novel in a trilogy. And I did the artwork for uh, Dexcon uh, 15 and 16. And I run the Artist Alley for Deadpool Exposure. Mm -hmm. like Hi. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm Lisanne Lake. I've been uh, an illustrator for oh, too many years. Uh, I started working doing paintings for Dragon Magazine. I do mostly science fiction, fantasy, and gaming. I've done over 200 book covers. And recently, I've been doing a lot of work for Chivalry and Sorcery, fifth edition, doing the entire books. I'm doing, at the moment, 50 paintings for Bestiary. And paintings. So busy. Your turn, Hal. <laughs> uh, I'm Hal Mangold, the uh, art director for uh, Green Ronin Publishing, and I also run a small imprint on the side called Atomic Overmind Press. Um, and I've approved Lizanne's work before, back when she was working on Doomtown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Way back laughs> the I thought you were familiar that way. <laughs> yeah, way back in the day. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm sort of representing the publisher side here. Uh, <laughs> And I have a loud cat, so if you hear her when I'm talking, I apologize. Okay, so I'll basically go through the outline, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them over the chat, and we'll uh, we'll uh, address them. A magic voice will convey them to us silently. <laughs> so, um, I guess... Uh, start with finding artists a bit more brief than we did in the earlier panel today um so basically looking online facebook deviantart um art station now is a good one yeah art station's huge they kind of took over for cg hub when cg hub cratered so yeah, I ju I'm just switching over to it now, and I'm really liking it. Yeah, it's a really nice interface. Just speaking to someone who browses a lot of portfolios, ArtStation is very, very nice. You can date your work. It's, it's easy for me as an artist to see what's your old stuff, what's your new stuff. It's real cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, conventions are good. Um, I always find face-to-face -face are better to see if you can – if you get along with the person, it's, it makes working together easier, I feel. Or just – yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I always do a walk through at Gen Con and walk through the artist alleyway and stuff. And yeah. And uh, yeah. And then once once you find your artists, when you contact them, be polite. Uh, which is odd that you have to say it, but you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, then email them or approach them at, with an idea of what your project is going to be. If, if you have an idea of how many images you're looking for, um, you're looking for a cover, you're looking for more than one artist or multiples, you know, and generally give them a, it, uh, an idea of what you're looking for. It's good to have a, if you have it, it's good to have a small write-up or at least uh, whether it's actually typed up or not, just have a small idea of what you're going for. Yeah, just just to add in, if I can, for fi for oh, absolutely, for, yeah, for finding artists in a Harlem. I think if you're a small publisher and you have a project and and you're looking for artists and you want to keep it pretty cheap, honestly, just being flat out open with what your budget is and broadcasting that on social media may get you some people you might not expect if it's an interesting project. If you were to say, mm -hmm. "I've got this project, here's what I can pay," you know, it's a paying project. I'm obviously not doing this for free. Um, you know, uh, and you're putting it out there, you may get some people that are new that would not you would not find otherwise. Uh, social media can be a very good place to do that. There are a ton of really uh, also uh, hashtags on the, there are like portfolio hashtags on Twitter that people put out that are absolutely amazing for finding people you've never heard of from parts of the world you've never would even even thought. So mm -hmm. social media can nice. be a great place to look for artists. I'm going to double down on what Hal said. 
I really appreciate it when an art director tells me their budget and doesn't hide it and dance around. Then I can be honest and tell them exactly what I can do for that price. Yeah. yeah. As being as an art director, I'm never insulted when somebody says to me, I can't work for that because I know what I can pay. I know what I can't pay. And if you can't work for what I can pay, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. You're not going to insult me. Yeah, exactly. And uh, to make a good faith effort to pay your artists mm -hmm. because uh, actually paid artists are more likely uh, you'll get better work ethic out of people that you're paying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. 100%. Um, you, you can, if you pay people on time, sometimes you can pay them less if you pay them on time. That is just a fact. Like artists are happy, as, as I found, have been happy to know they will get the money they are promised when they are promised it. You may get a slight discount on uh, what you might have to pay otherwise if you're going to be late or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, don't expect your artists to work for free. Exposure is not pay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially if you're small press. You don't have the exposure to give us, even we'll if you think you exposure. do. <laughs> yeah. So you're offering to pay for exposure, but you but you're not paying. <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, honestly, if Wizards of the Coast probably could get some people to work for them for exposure because it would be actual exposure. But you're not Wizards of the Coast if you're worrying about this sort of level of budgeting with your art. So yeah, don't <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pay for art. <laughs> Um, no unpaid test work or test pages. Um, oh, doing things on spec. No. Uh, doing things on spec. <laughs> I, I did something on spec with my first job and that was it. And he still offered to pay me something beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, whether he used it or not. So yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good person to work for then if they're willing to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he obviously the, the licensing cost would have been much, it was much higher than actual, than just paying for the piece for, for personal. But, uh, but yeah, he, he did, did a good job and he's been a very good client that he's come back to me year after year. So, but um, if you want experienced artists, don't expect them to work for free mm -hmm. at all. If you want to test an artist, give them one piece or two pieces Yeah, and a deadline. There's no, no law that says you have to use only one artist in a product. You can use many artists. <laughs> exactly. And there's, there's nothing that says you have to hire them for the entire job up front. Mm -hmm. Hire them for one piece with with the and just be honest with them say i'm going to hire you for one piece and if i if i like where it goes there will be more work mm -hmm. if you have a long deadline yeah sorry we have a question from the audience what do you mean by on spec and that's wow. a way to that that's good for both because then if it's if it's not going to work we have a question jack yeah, yeah what was the uh, the definition of on spec i think that's a that's on a speculation term. Yeah. Basically, do a piece for us and we'll see if we like it and we'll and, pay you. Uh, if we like it, we'll pay you. No, you pay for the piece. Yeah, if you it's, don't it's, like it, fine. <laughs> it's basically an, un, it'd be an uncontracted work, which is not cool. You should always have contracts. You should always have it's mm -hmm, called the mm -hmm. transfer of the rights and everything like that. So, yeah, I think that on spec is basically you're doing a piece of work essentially for free. Theoretically, you could get paid for it, but there's no guarantee that because you have, don't have any legal contractual thing in place for it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Jack. It'll be frozen up, Jack. Jack's frozen oh. up there. Uh, 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 you, you still there, Jack? You good? Yeah. Um, I was having a little bit of connection issues. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you now. Yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just bumped out for a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, if we want, we can get into some contract talk now too. Well, there was, um, a, yeah, you're, up to, you're up to pay on acceptance of art, not publication. I think that's, that's mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. yeah. Speaking as someone, as a publisher, uh, we used to pay on publication and just as a, Oh movie, my God. Oh, well, come on. <laughs> there, there, actually, there actually was a point where it was a financial issue where for us, it was like, we put out the book, we got paid for the book, we paid the artists and everything like that. 
it, it, it's something that some companies do out of financial necessity. Mm-hmm. However, I don't think it's a good practice if you're a stable company. Once you can, do, you know, if, if you are doing that to start with, I get it simply as a business thing. You're not going to get a lot of artists, artists who are going to like it. And I understand that. Um, but morally, it is better to pay somebody when they do the work. You can say pay 30 days after. You can pay say pay 60 days after. But a fixed contractual time where they have done the work and they get paid is a much better way to get people to work for you. And you'll sleep better because you have actually paid the people for the work they've done. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And I, I have the 30 day pay, uh, pay from 30 days of completion yeah, that's in my contracts. Way. Generally, what, what, I, what I do in contracts when I when I do stuff too, if it's a rush job, sometimes I'll be like, "Look, you finish it." You know, like if somebody dropped out of a project and I need it fast, you finish it, I'll pay you. But yeah, I often deli- I often delineate the rights and then say rights transfer upon payment. Huh? That, that, oh, that's nice. a, a really that's a good way to guarantee that you get paid. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I I take it further, and they get a they don't get a high res image until I get until. Mm-hmm. Uh, until I get paid, or at least until I send them the invoice. Yeah, that's. I think that's absolutely fair. Yep. Um. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Pay on acceptance, not publication. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, if you work something out beforehand, some some artists, except especially some starting out, might work on on something like that. But still, you're you're working with new artists who aren't as sure and aren't as uh practiced in deadlines or anything like Mm -hmm. that um but that's another way to uh balance your price is you might want to have an experienced artist do your cover and then have some newer artists try some newer artists for some small interiors or something like that i can also give you on that side Another way I help people not break the bank is I'll take a project on, I'll take the whole project, I'll look at all the pieces, and then I'll give a whole price. I won't break it down. This one's this much money, this one's this much money, this one's this much money. I'll say, I'll do this project for this much money, not per piece, which ends up giving the publisher a discount. Yeah, certainly for a one for one artist project, that's fine. Or mm-hmm. they they could say like, so when I when I sign art, I generally do it on a, a it, it. We've moved away, f- like it's usually a page rate with a, where a page is broken up mm-hmm. into a certain amount of pieces. Right. Of stuff. And uh, a lot of times, I just find out how many pieces and uh, pages an artist wants, and then I, then I make sure I sort of give them an idea of how that'll be broken down because obviously there's a big difference oh, between sense. doing yeah. four mm-hmm. pages that's four big pieces and four pages that is four, you know, or little pieces. Yeah. yeah 16 or uh, little pieces. Pages or something. Yeah. And if it's a complicated piece or a simple piece, yeah, like yeah, is yeah. it, is it one figure or is it 50, you know? Yeah, or I, I, for all. yeah. <laughs> in fact, I'll just, I'll just mention that just as an art director from the art direction standpoint, I think that it behooves an art director to be sensitive to the complexity of image for the amount of money you're paying for it. Like don't expect to jam a hugely complicated battle scene in a quarter page piece of art that you are paying $125 for. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's, a, that's the thing is, is, is you need to balance out your image complexity with what you are paying for it so that your artist will, will, honestly, you'll get better work that way because an artist who feels like they're being paid fairly for a piece is gonna put more effort into it. And that's just the that's just thing. So, so think about that when you are putting together your, your art some artists work exclusively, I found, on a piece basis. That's harder for me sometimes because sometimes, you know, uh, uh, that's the axis of like the the uh, I guess uh, the the good fast cheap uh, triangle that I think I think Jack probably wanted to bring up at some point in here. Is that is the, yeah absolutely mm-hmm. yeah. There's good, there's fast, and there's cheap. Usually you can pick two, you can't pick three. Um, if you find the artist who does all three, dear God, hold on to them and make sure you give them periodic raises and stuff so it's still cheap but not. <laughs> That's cheap. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I, I guess reliable is also in there somewhere. I think there's almost a fourth axis. That's like a fourth dimensional <laughs> away from the triangle. So, but, um, but yeah, just be sensitive to what you are, 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 are asking for what you are charging. Uh, mm-hmm. and don't, and if you get pushback from an artist, then, you know, that that's, that's fair from the artist's standpoint that they, that the artist has to be willing to work for what you're paying. So. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's another point I have on my outline here. The the lower your pay rate, the lower the demands on the artist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if so, you're paying if you're paying five hundred dollars an image, 
by God, I think you're within rights to ask for a lot of revisions to make sure you get that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. If you're paying 50 bucks for an image, be explicit up front because you're not going to be able to ask for too many changes. <laughs> no, no, exactly. No. exactly. Which is an, is another point. Uh, what, when I work, work with a, a client, I always send uh, sketches and or and clean li- and clean lines at different points. All things that are very changeable. Mm-hmm. Once I start getting into permanent medium, I only allow a certain amount of revisions before it's extra cost. Yeah, I, th- I think there's it's worth talking about the distinction here between people who work in physical medium versus digital too. Because for instance, if I know somebody does physical painting, like uh, are you familiar with the, the painter David Leary? He did done a no. bunch of covers stuff. He does incredibly intricate actual painted covers and they are amazing. But because of that, I would not ask for a crap ton of revisions. Whereas if somebody is a digital artist, changes are pretty easy to do for digital artists. Uh, you know, um, it, it's, it's, yeah. a, it, it's a lot less of an ask. You're not asking somebody to like, gesso out part of a canvas and redraw something in you're just oh, yeah you're asking though, to- though when you're getting into digital painting sometimes it is almost as much work to fix that uh, yeah yeah i i i'm though not saying, a lot more achievable but yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying it's not but but there is like there's a it's a it's a shooting a bullet throwing it difference to a, it with some artists it's just a huge difference yeah between the two. yeah whereas i i i'm a kind of a hybrid mm-hmm. artist for for most of my clients i uh do all my line work and inking by hand and then i color digitally mm-hmm. right so if you get me before if you get me before the ink, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's easy, yeah. Lizanne, are you still all physical or are you digital? You're really physical. I'm a complete <laughs> idiot with computers. Um, but I'm fast, so it doesn't matter, but I do all the complex paintings in a sketch. I do very, yep. very intricate sketches. And they're usually shaded for the sometimes. Sometimes it's line drawings, depending on the client. No, I, th- I think a lot of physical artists do that. Like I've worked mm-hmm. with Wayne Reynolds and Wayne, Wayne does a mm-hmm. completely yeah. rendered pencil version of the painting yeah. before exactly. he to mm-hmm. the point where I once bought a painting and the pencil version of the painting for it and framed them both up and gave one of them to a friend of mine because they were both amazing. And they were nice. both yeah, totally one of my publishers just bought my pencil sketch of one of go. the covers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I do that too. I, I work up my pencils completely because I work, I, I'm primarily, uh, uh pencil pencil is my strongest medium so i'll do that stuff real fast and then like but the painting takes a little longer so yeah the yeah. pencil dictate everything yeah so i'll have a pretty detailed pencil so that probably probably beho- mentions maybe talk to the artist that you're hiring and be like where is the easiest change point for you if i need to make alterations that's an area where you can <laughs> save, save trouble any anytime you save the artist effort you are oh yeah saving, that's are saving money that's idea. yourself mm-hmm. you, you are you can make it easier for the artist to do the job. You can, you, you can end up, you know, that that's, that's good. You're going to get better work and you're going to and probably end up paying less. If you, fewer changes equals, you know, less money. So. And an artist that will work for you again. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. What do we got here? Um, does anybody have any questions before we moved on? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump in with one. Uh, what red flags should you look at when you're looking for artists? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll mention one just because uh, we were talking about it before this uh, this thing. If you are if you have an artist approaching you and you're new and they are so amazingly good that you wonder why they're willing to work for you, there's sometimes a reason. <laughs> be careful because reliability can be an issue. I've, I've worked with some artists who are fantastic people and complete basket cases in terms of being able to perform the work. Like their talent is off the scale but they can't actually do it. So maybe if somebody approaches you like that, maybe ask around a little bit. Um, uh, but that, that's a, that's a, that's a red flag right there that I would, I would say. Um, yeah, that's one. Mm-hmm. Artists yeah. who are too personal. And so, sometimes so like when I would. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jay. No, that's okay. When, when I was starting out, I, I went a bit cheaper too, because I am not the fastest of artists, but I'm honest mm-hmm. about that, you know? When, uh, with line work, I'm pretty fast, but when it gets to painterly stuff, it, it takes me some time. So I make sure people know that. And in the beginning, especially, I charged a bit less, but that's not always the case when you meet new people. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort, of, sort of the opposite of a red flag is if you ask an artist something and they quote you a rate that is too high for you, 
don't get mad just find somebody else it's it's mm -hmm. like you know if, they, if yeah. they're, they're making a decision about what their work what their time is worth to them and it's worth respecting that because um you know there are artists who who i've worked with who are fantastic but they can't work for what i pay because their time they can't they can't do their speed doesn't make that worth their money and i i respect exactly. that but there are other artists i've worked with who are fantastic who i probably i mean i might even end up paying them less than they could get by their quality but because of their speed and how much time it takes to do them they're just fine working for what i can pay on a mm -hmm. particular project because they can execute it in a way that gives them a perfectly reasonable you know return on what on their time so and if you find an artist who turns you down ask them for a recommendation they might know somebody who is starting out and reliable absolutely Art mm -hmm. artists have lots of friends as i have, mm -hmm. as I have yep. uh, artists they talk they talk to each yes. other yes <laughs> oh, we do. <laughs> Which brings to another point. If you treat an artist poorly, all other okay. artists will know. <laughs> yeah, especially someone established. Just just do not be a jerk to an established artist because, yeah, it, it won't do you any good. It will not end well for you. <laughs> uh, let's yeah, see but, you know, you have more questions? No, I'm just saying, what do we got? What else have we got on the uh, uh, Jack? Jack outline. quite kindly put together an outline here, uh, so we covered all our topics. Okay. Right. Um, how do you how do you feel about reusing art that's been used in other non competing projects? Oh, that's called second rights art, and that is your godsend if you're a beginning publisher. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Because and the artists love it; they nod their head and get money. Yeah. Yeah. Ex <laughs> exactly. It's quite a bit. Uh, it costs quite a bit less to, to use something that's already been created than to have an artist create something specifically for you, but they still get money for the rights. So basically they're getting money for work they've already done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in fact, it can be worth approaching fairly high profile uh, established artists who have done a, a pretty big body of work and asking them about second use writing one of their paintings that they don't have, you know, because some people like, uh, I mean, even people on the level of like, uh, like uh, speaking of people we've done second rights stuff with like Todd Lockwood or somebody like that. My, back, back in the early 2000s when Green Ronin was, uh, was younger, we second used a, a, a couple of covers from Todd Lockwood and they were fantastic. And, and they were absolutely worth the money we paid for him. And we paid less than we would have if he had done an original one for us. Mm -hmm. so it's nice. A good, way, good way to save some money is to look into higher profile artists who have done or, or if you go on an artist portfolio site and they've got a personal piece that they've done. And usually a lot of times people will note mm -hmm. personal piece and you're like, that's really great. I would like to use that. Contact the artist and see if you can come to some sort of agreement. They've already done the work. So for them, it's yeah. free money a lot of times. So yeah, Mo most often the only reason uh, an artist would deny you on something like that is if the rights are given to somebody else and they're not, they're contractually not allowed to. Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, I guess a good next topic to jump into is contracts. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, always work with a contract. Mm -hmm. um, where's my list here? Um, oh, I lost my contract list. So I'll just do this off the cuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, rights. Uh, never work for hire. Uh, you see, this is the one part where you and I are going to discuss. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> figured. <laughs> well, um, I've worked for hire for like, you know, uh, you, the gaming systems that work for Microsoft doing Age of Empires. You work for hire. Yeah. They yeah. pay you for it. though. <laughs> yeah. What work for hire is, is basically it gives every bit of rights of the artwork over to the client. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, like. Technically, they don't even have to put your name on it. No, that's that's actually not true. I don't think because there no. there's actually, there actually are three there are three levels of rights. There's the there's the shared rights thing. There's work for hire where you, I pay you to do it, but I have to credit you for it. And then there's moral rights, and that's a whole other thing. Moral rights is literally I own that everything about this, and I don't have to credit you. And and the only reason I know oh, who maybe. This is because we worked with uh, when at Green Run, and we worked with DC Comics, and mm -hmm. um, when we were licensing the DC Comics role playing game. They gave us a list of art that was just absolutely free, like that we could use for anything. 
and we didn't and we actually not only didn't have to credit the artist we were specifically legally enjoined from crediting the artist oh now the, like for instance the four covers of our of our uh, of our books i think it was all four we all used alex ross pieces for them but we didn't credit alex ross as the cover artist on at least two of those even though it was obviously alex ross because dc had purchased the moral rights for those covers so they they were owned completely by okay by dc so so we do have to credit you if we if we do work for hire i believe at least you know i i would, okay. never, I would never think of not crediting somebody that i even would work yeah. for hire. but uh basically work for hire gives the uh client complete control of the piece the mm -hmm. publishing rights absolutely yes yeah. anything not stipulated in the contract we will control uh speaking mm -hmm. as uh, speaking as a publisher a lot of times we do work for hire because uh stuff that's being depicted is an intellectual property item from us and we want to control it uh yeah. so that's why we would do that in our contracts, for instance, though, we, for instance, specifically license artists to make prints, sell, blah, 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 do stuff with it that is not in conflict with us as a publisher mm -hmm. in terms of that. So, uh, okay. Personal and, promotional rights. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I guess it's better to say, uh, as a small, as a small publisher or small press, you're likely not going to need all the rights that, uh, work for hire gives. And it is absolutely a money saving method to go to an artist and say, I would like to do this piece. I want to use it this one time. You can have it for anything else. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, that, that is because then you're producing, you're asking the artist to produce something that they then can monetize in other ways. So mm -hmm. you're going to, there's an incentive, you know, for them to, to do a, do a good job on it and B, you know, it, it, it's a, uh, it becomes a more collaborative process then too, because they own what you're producing as well as them. There are definitely. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, I I've done I that. definitely charge a lot more for work for hire. And that's fair. Because they're basically purchasing all the rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I did want to explain the concept because there are reasons that companies do do it. Yeah, that that's true. Like, that is true. Yeah, yeah. The token estate when I worked yeah. with, yeah, the yeah. yeah. That had to be work for hire. Pretty much, I'll, I expect work for hire maybe from some larger companies or, or, large, or larger. Uh, mm hmm larger ips but not, but not anything from the people here yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking to keep your game affordable not doing work for hire is a wonderful way to keep mm -hmm. your costs a little bit lower yeah, yeah. So. i once actually had someone offer me for small interiors 25 a piece work for hire <laughs> and i'm like no that's thank you <laughs> I, I would never insult an artist with offering that little that's ridiculous and this is someone who i'd met at cons over and over and over again yeah yeah, yeah. and i'm like <laughs> And I no longer see him at cons, so. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> well, and that speaks to another thing that, that you can do to save some money is learn, get a good idea of what people are paying, if you can. Talk to other publishers if you're, if you're developing your game and everything like that. Get an idea of what they paid because you don't want to offer an artist an insulting amount of money because they won't take it and you'll get a rep as somebody who's trying to lowball people and it's just not good. If you're trying to save money, don't, don't, don't do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, yeah. And if you're trying to save mon money, something you can do is like we were saying, first rights, second rights. First rights is when the piece is actually created for the product. And second rights is, is where uh, you use something that's already created. Um, and also, it's perfectly fair for you to come back. And if you have a specific use you want to put a piece to that it doesn't directly conflict with what the person is doing, have it put in the contract. If you put it in the contract that you say, you know, I want to make T-shirts of this piece after it's done. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, speaking as a, again, as a publisher, I'd be fine with that. Just we'll, mm -hmm. we'll write a line and I'm in there that you can do that. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. I yeah, say give and, me a T-shirt usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It'd be, literally be like, give me a T-shirt when you get it, you know, when you do it. Yeah. That's, that's the price. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that that's the other thing, like you don't, don't pay for more rights than you need for your project. You know, if you only need it for one purpose, you don't need to buy all the rights. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that the uh, artist will be very happy to sell you more rights later if you decide you need it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can always come back and buy more, buy the piece mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. later. If you have turns out, you, say you do a, a cover for your game and your game takes off and it's huge. And all of a sudden you've got an IP issue, an IP character on your cover and you need it. Go back to the artist and be like, look, I'd like to buy the work for hire. You know, I'd like to buy the whole mm -hmm. rights for this. So let's negotiate a price. Mm -hmm. Pretty easy about that. <laughs>
Uh, James Wallace in chat notes that uh, it's worth making the point that if you're working with a licensed property, there's a very high chance that the artist will be required to sign over all the copyright. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. I, th I yeah. think that I think our thought is probably if you're working on a licensed project, you may be a, a level above the sort of like getting it the cheapest possible. But that's absolutely consideration. That that certainly the other things we've talked about in terms of demands on the artist and everything like that go. But certainly. There are situations where the publisher will have no choice but to go work for hire simply because they are beholden to the person that has licensed them the property. James makes a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but the artists will more likely be willing to work to work out something with that because it's not going to be a super duper low ball rate that they're going to be True. paid for that. And, and I mean, hopefully, if you're an artist, you understand that you know when you encounter a licensed project you're just going to have to, that's something you should expect walking into that sort of thing. Yeah. And that that's the other thing with contracts. Contracts are to protect, protect both parties. Mm -hmm. They're not for one or the other. You both have to sign it. I actually had someone give me a contract just requiring my signature. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's an NDA. That's not a contract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have a basic contract that I work with that I that started with my first client that I just really liked and it was easy to read. Um, but you know, if there's something in the contract you don't like, feel free to ask the artist if they'll be willing to change it or meet somewhere in the middle. You know, mm -hmm. that's you know, another. Good, oh, Hal made a very good point. Non-disclosure agreement. You should ask the artist not to show your piece around if you don't want it shown before publication. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. Um, a lot of times just to ask, asking people, I, I have artists ask me all the time, can I show this in my portfolio? And if I say, Hey, can you wait a month? There's no problem with that. <laughs> but if you, if it's actually an IP issue or something like that, yeah. Uh, don't be afraid to NDA them. There, no, no artist should be afraid of an NDA in terms of like, you know, I can only show this after I'm given permission or something like that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not Yeah. And I'll, and I'll pretty much, if I, if I know someone's publishing something, I'll always ask, when can I show the art? You know, yeah. when can I show it? And frankly, as a again, as a publisher, a lot of times people showing the art while the you know while either the PDF release is out or something like that is absolutely no big deal whatsoever. I mean, we're kind of we're kind of away from the a, a lot a large part of away from the area of like we must keep everything hidden until you know the last minute of the book coming out. Where a lot of times, <laughs> it's like letting people show stuff off is actually kind of cool. So, yeah, and it's actually advertising. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it advertises your piece especially if you're going to kickstart it or something like that. Yeah. It's good to have that advanced advertisement. Yeah. Uh, in fact, mentioning Kickstarter stuff is, is probably good, right? I mean, like, like uh, with Kickstarter stuff, you should absolutely never accept an on publication thing. I would think um, speaking as a, as both an art director and publisher, if somebody comes to you for a Kickstarter, if you're if you're trying to do a Kickstarter, expect to pay up front for the art you're going to use for promotion for it. That's just going to be yep. sort of part of your sunk cost for promoting your your Kickstarter. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's, it's not fair for a project that theoretically could not fund to not pay your artists. Initially. Yeah, unless yeah, they're part, I, unless they're partners in the Kickstarter. So exactly, yeah. Like I definitely uh, I worked on a Kickstarter and it didn't fund. Definitely got paid ahead of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the way they set it up is they offered me more work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Upon. Yeah. And, and, and I think that a money saving strategy uh, could be you hire an artist and say, I can pay this now. If this funds, I will pay you an additional amount. And that's, you know, if the artist agrees to that, I think that's fair. I mean, the artist is, is sort of banking on the project being good. Um, um, but be upfront about the fact that you are crowdfunding this and it could fail and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, it's a, it's not a, it's not a, a, a shady way to do business if you're upfront about that whole thing, I think, and you're looking yeah. to get some money on the, on the, on the front end. Yeah. And, and I might uh, be willing to do that if I really believe in the project, but I'll want to see the project first to see if it's cohesive yeah. enough to it's got legs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, going back a little, uh, Archangel Games asked, uh, do publishers need to have a contract for art or do most artists have their own contract? Um, speaking as a publisher, uh, Green Run and Publishing and Atomic Government Press, we have our own contract that we've gotten from over the years. So I, I usually use that. Um, and and I'm, honestly, if, uh, most artists are just fine with it. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward contract. It talks about transfers of rights. 
it, it, it stipulates a deadline, it stipulates payment, it stipulates payment terms, it stipulates mm -hmm. uh, 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 complimentary copies afterward uh, and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, so I mean, that's fine. If you are starting out and you don't know anything about it, um, you can either ask other publishers or uh, if an artist has a good contract. Honestly, if an artist has a good has a contract that works for you, there's nothing stopping you from you from pretty much copying it whole cloth and using it elsewhere. I mean, if they if their contract yeah, yeah. works, you know, it's 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 a it, it's a good thing. But, yeah, but read, I, them, read them carefully. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. I I often offer my my contract to people if they want it. I'll send them a blank copy. I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I got it from a different client and then I edited it as the years went on and different things were needed in the contract. Mm -hmm. But the original copy was looked over by a lawyer and everything like that. So, yeah. So yeah. I'm saying the starting out people, please use the contract because it's your only protection against someone who doesn't meet a deadline. Yeah. And from, a, from another standpoint, if you are hiring somebody who you don't know, whose work you have seen and has no reputation, it is theoretically possible that uh, you are hiring somebody who is reselling somebody else's artwork or something like mm -hmm. that. It's, it's unlikely, but it's possible. And if you have a con legal contract with you, that protects you as much as it, mm -hmm. as it protects them. It's, it's a thing mm -hmm. where you can be like, look, I signed a legal contract with this person who said they had the rights to this. Therefore, mm -hmm. I am not in the wrong for having used this. It is they who are in the wrong for having sold me it. So yeah, yeah, all contracts are good for everybody. Always use them, yeah. The typical yep. contract says the artist is responsible for an, an image if it's plagiarized in the contract, not the publisher. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. It puts the creation on the artist, and then the mm -hmm. artist transfers the rights. Therefore, if the artist didn't have the rights to transfer, it's not on the publisher's end of, of things. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's the artist who has done the bad thing, not the publisher. The publisher has acted in good faith. So you want to have that protecting you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, which, uh, brings in another part about contracts, uh, kill fees. Yeah. Um, uh, I, uh, honestly, we don't use them a lot just because I haven't had to kill fee a lot of people. I've, vo I've voluntarily killed fee people, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking for that to be written into a contract. And if an artist asked me to, I probably would. So it's, just, <laughs> yeah. it's not something that I've been lucky enough not to have to really deal with. And, um, but, but if you are hiring artists who ask for a kill fee and, uh, and a kill fee is, if you get to a certain point in the project and decide you don't want to proceed, but the artist has done work, you still are agreeing to pay them a portion of what you, you were initially agreed to because they did work. It just didn't work out. So, or more importantly, if you don't want to deal with the project anymore. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a project that wasn't working out with, uh, uh, you know, he was fine with all the pieces and everything like that, but he actually decided to not do the project mm -hmm. at all anymore. Mm -hmm. So he paid me uh, a kill fee towards uh, what I had already done mm -hmm. yeah. and just ended the project. What kind of percentage wise uh, kill fees do you guys usually, would you, get, you guys usually request? I, I request depending on the, the, how much you've done, how much is done of the piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, if the piece is completely finished, you're going to pay for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll, the way I work with clients is I always send progress sketches or or stages throughout the uh, process for often just for input from the client. Um, but depends on what stage it's at. If it's if it's only half done, I'm only going to charge half the kill fee, basically mm -hmm. half half the cost for kill fee. Yeah, but you you can negotiate like uh, when you're in your contract, you can say like. If at any point we want to stop this, uh, we negotiate a fifty percent kill fee and we all walk mm -hmm, away. Mm -hmm. And that's you know that's that's you know it can either be adjustable or it can be a fixed thing. I've seen it mm -hmm. done fixed things in some contracts, but it can be. A yeah, good that's idea. fine too. And that that's all agreed at uh, at the beginning, and then nobody walks away angry if it's all absolutely. Even if you finish uh, the piece, the artist retains all rights to it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, it's like, so, if you kill, yeah. if you kill fee somebody, the work reverts to them. You own, you own nothing about it. And that's, that's an important thing to know, mm -hmm. but um, it's not like you kill fee and you get to keep what they've done. It's, it's a, <laughs> it's, a it's a payment for their work and make it's, it's what it is there ideally to do is to make the artist feel better about working with you because hopefully you never have to use it as the, as the mm -hmm. of insurance insurance clause basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, I'm going to go back to a question here. Uh, Kevin Culp asked uh, specifically for Hal, uh, what's the des density of art that you typically use for an RPG in terms of art per number of pages? What's oh, a budget per page? 
that, that's a that's a tricky question because um it, it very much depends on what what kind of project you're doing what kind of design ethos you're working with it are you working with a six by nine book that's going to be an indie rpg or are you doing a full-on you know laid out rpg i think if you were going to do a, a, a full-on standard you know your eight and a half by eleven hardcover book rpg you probably want to look at an art density between about 10 and 15 percent 15 percent is 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 best if you can afford it. It, it. it affords you a pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. you know, piece of art every every six pages, three, every three spreads or something like that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, but um, but it, it that that's probably a good rule of thumb is, is ten to fifteen percent. I would think mm -hmm. it's probably about right in terms of in terms of density. Um, but again, like if you're doing a game that is uh, is not as dependent on art and can be, and your graphic designer can do graphic elements, you can save a lot of money on that sort of stuff. That's a so a, a, a quality graphic designer can send, save you money on art. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a graphic designer too, but it is what it is. Uh, uh, can save you money on, on art by figuring out where you need the art and also coming up with graphic solutions that, that sort of substitute for art. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much of the opinion that less better art is better than more worse art. So your, your book is going to be better off if you spend money on fewer key pieces that are awesome than if you do it the other way around and you just have a bunch of stuff that's mediocre and everywhere. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's, and if, I think. And if it, does, also, oh, I'm sorry. if it you does super also, well and, and you need to reprint it, you can add more pieces later. That's true. And exactly. failing a graphic designer, you can also split the work between some key pieces in there and several simple pieces. How the artists do the sword, the helm, you know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and it can be worth spending money on some decorative element work as mm -hmm. well. Like, um, that that stuff that can be repeatedly used throughout your project as recurring little graphic themes and things yeah. like that. That can be a good way to spend to spend. That can be a good place to spend a little bit of money that pays off big because it becomes a repeating element mm -hmm. you can use throughout your your project. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Another uh, good point. Next, oh, next go ahead, question. Andy. Next question on here. Are you guys ready? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, how often should you expect updates from the artist? Uh, I'm sorry. How often should you expect updates from the artist on the status of your project? Uh, I think you should negotiate that when you do the contract, honestly. Um, uh, it, it doesn't have to be in the contract, but uh, generally when I first hire an artist, I'm kind of like, you know, we, we sort of figure out like, what do you want to see? Do you, some, some artists want to send you everything. I've worked with artists who are kind of like, they'll send me like every couple of days, they'll send me an update on a piece. And I'm like, great, yeah. man, that's cool. Didn't need to see that, but you know, but, <laughs> um, but if you feel like you're going to have to steer the artist, you should absolutely like be like, I want to see a pencil sketch. I want to see it, you know, a, 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 a blocking shading render. You know, you can be as specific as you like, as long as you are clear with your expectations and the artist agrees to them is really mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Um, in, in terms of turnaround, I mean, that's that's, again, an artist dependent thing. Some artists are super fast. Some artists are slower. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I once had someone ask me for daily updates and I'm like, no. No. <laughs> no. Who, who has do you want time? me to do the art or do you want me to constantly update you? <laughs> yeah. Lizanne, when you work, how often do you do you usually what do you like a pencil? Do you do a pencil? I do a sketch and I'll send it and we'll have an agreed deadline and I'll do a cover, you know, finish the a big finished piece uh -huh. and we'll have an agreed deadline and I'll send it. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, know, so you, generally do, you generally do sketch finish. That's pretty much correct. Right. If I'm doing a whole lot of interiors, I'll, and I'm doing multiple paintings a week. I'll just ship them every week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I do usually compositional sketches, mm -hmm. then finish lines, then finish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if if the client wants more in between, sure. Um, mm -hmm. But I usually my compositional sketches can be a little on the rough side. Um, mm -hmm. So if they're that rough, I definitely show them a detailed drawing before it gets to finish. Yeah. No, I, I sit there and I'm, my pencils are like <laughs> pencils, <Yeah. laughs> pencil yeah. drawings. Yeah, I mean, I gener generally, you know, when I work with artists, I generally want to see a comp, uh, where it, which is a comp, a comp sketch is just basically like somebody has blocked out basically where all the action is going to go. Where like, this mm -hmm. is a figure, this is a figure here. There's no real detail, but you can see where they're standing and what they're doing. Uh, and then sort of a finished mid mid range, see how everything is developing and then a finish. And that's generally that's another generally important cool. thing. I note all the colors I'm going to put in the painting. That that's actually super mm -hmm. important for color work. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I if if I'm doing a 
I don't always know right off in the beginning what all the colors are going to be, but I add another stage for that when it's going to be a color uh, cover mm-hmm. or something like that. I'll send them. I'll send them a couple of color comp sketches mm-hmm. to give them a, an idea of like these are the color compositions I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. What do you like? What do you want changed? Mm-hmm. You know, if you have color preferences stated before I decide yeah. the color format, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Actually, while we're talking about that, let's let's just mention that. Um, be as clear with your artists as humanly possible in terms of what you want. That is going to be a good, another good way to save yourself money is be clear about your expectations. Now, you need to figure out what your artist responds to best. Some artists respond best to an extremely explicit description detailing where everything is. Some artists work better with like, it's a fight scene with these two characters, make it awesome. You know, that, that <laughs> literally is how I deal with some of my different artists. Is someone, yeah. someone a lot mm-hmm. of handholding? Uh, some, 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 uh, some don't need it, but figure out what they need and give it to them. And, and that will also uh, allow you to, you know, to, to keep them both working for you and probably working for you at the rate you can pay. If yeah. you and, and, real- if you, and if you have, if you give them virtually no direction, don't expect to get what you want the first time. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. This yeah. is another big point, especially with the large male population of publishers. Uh, many, Art direct, several art directors I've worked with are colorblind. I advise them to go out and get a friend. And I say, this color is very sour. You don't want to use that. They can't realize this. Go get a friend and ask their opinion of the color. That's cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. so for, for color work, if, you're, if you know you have color issues, get somebody who knows better mm-hmm. To, mm-hmm. so that you're giving the artist proper feedback for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, since we're under 15 minutes now, I'm gonna give you one more question here, uh, probably two. Uh, what are some other considerations that you should make when working with a team of artists who are doing separate pieces or even combined pieces? Uh, okay, that's, that's probably a, a question for, for me, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I would say in that case, look carefully at your at your body of work and and sort of try to figure out where the dependencies are. Try to figure out like, this character is super important and is gonna be depicted in a bunch of pieces. So figure out who you want to do that. And, and there's nothing wrong with, with giving an artist, uh, uh, when they, you give them a, a, a list of work to do, prioritizing stuff and be like, I need this piece done first because other people need to see it mm-hmm. so they can do their work. So that that's a, that's a good way to do it is to just look at your dependency, your depiction dependencies, I guess you'd call them, in terms of how stuff will be will be um, uh, depicted to make sure that you don't have uh, a a disconnect between depictions of things that need to be the same in different pictures if you have that sort of thing going on. Uh, In terms of of how to deal with it otherwise, I mean, honestly, if you've selected a group of artists whose styles all kind of jive together, you really shouldn't have to do too much. I mean, uh, that that, that comes down to sort of the the art, art, art picking section where you look at a bunch of artists' styles and see how they're going to work out together. And if they're going to work out together, then you, you probably don't need to do it. Although when I'm when I'm putting together a book, um, I try to sort of set up a rhythm of the presentation of the artists. So like if you have if you have say six artists on a book, I, I try to make sure that their their work is sort of spread out throughout the entire. The, the two ways to do it: you either have their work spread out through the entire book, so that there's kind of a rhythm to how you see the different t- styles hit, or you completely segregate it and you have an artist do like this artist is doing this chapter, this artist is doing this chapter or section. Mm-hmm. And something like that, and that creates a different sort of visual rhythm, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, so um, uh, that that's how, kind of how I would handle it, I guess. You guys have uh, speaking from the art standpoint. I mean, when you're working with other artists, what do you guys like to see when you're being presented? Uh, when you know you're working with a group of other people who are depicting the same uh, sort of stuff you are. Uh, Good reference. Yeah. yeah. Good if reference. Are, if someone has already created characters, I want to see them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so they match. You know, if someone's you know, creating characters, I want to know that they have, I have the right to do it. Yeah. 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 Well, no, I mean, characters created for the same project. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah mm-hmm. For instance, like in one of our, a couple of our games, we have iconic characters and I put together a document of iconic characters and whenever, mm. whenever we, someone's a project, I just send them that PDF and it has the depictions of them and they can go from there. So that's always super helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Is there any difference in working with a, a, a uh, two-dimensional artist versus a 3D model artist. You found that? Man, I, I have to admit, I have never worked with a 3D model artist. I've worked with artists who I'm pretty sure do some 3D rendering before they do their final renders because they use they use like 
there are um uh, like was it poser or something like that isn't that one yeah, of those poser or sometimes zbrush zbrush yeah where, where you can actually take a like a, a like a character model and you can pose them in different positions and then they may paint over that but um i actually don't have too much experience working with actual 3d render people um uh, mm -hmm. i mean and i don't think the, uh, i don't think jack or lazan are are 3D render people yeah. either. Yeah, we're mostly yeah. still media. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. miniature people who use 3D rendering, but hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, they yeah. use that stuff a lot these days. That's a that's a big yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. But in terms of how to <laughs> deal with it, I mean, I, my instinct would say it would be just deal, like dealing with anything else. Make sure you see sketches, you know, whatever those mm -hmm. are, or stuff like that, you know. But yeah, I mean, if it's a if it's a still image, it really doesn't matter. It's the same as any other illustration. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that's like movable for like a mobile game or an app or something like that, or I imagine out, they have their normal rates. I I don't yeah. know a lot about it. Or you're outputting something from uh, for uh, uh, um, 3D printing or something like that or casting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other sort of ball of wax. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions from the questionosphere? Uh, no questions. It looks like we've somehow managed to get through all of them. Right on. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at our uh, at our outline and see if there's anything else we need to hit here. I, I, honestly, we jumped a, around. I think we covered most of it. Well, here's <laughs> a good one, though. I don't think we've actually explicitly talked about. Don't expect your artist to begin work before the payment and contract details are finalized. Yeah, until you get a contract oh, yeah. done, don't expect, don't be like, you can start working and I'll get your contract in two weeks. Don't do that. Just get yeah. them the contract. <laughs> yeah, the, the only time I've started on something before the contract is all signed and something like that is someone that I've worked with many times before oh, yeah. that I totally <laughs> trust. And even mm -hmm. that, that's just usually like comp sketches or development work. It's not like seriously working in on a piece yet. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and you also have an expected contract with somebody you've worked before. You've used the same contract three times legally. They expect you to use the same contract the fourth time. Yeah. So uh, and it's also possible to set up standing contracts with people where you actually say like, you know, for every X pages of work you turn in, I will pay you X and it, this is an ongoing thing and you submit invoices and stuff like that. So, yeah. 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 So sometimes I work with a contract and an addendum, uh, the addendum for when there's multiple spelled out pieces mm -hmm. and, but that's all that, you know, that's something also signed and. Yeah. Uh, also um, one thing I'll say uh, when you're hiring people, figure out <clears throat> how they want to be paid early. Uh, because sometimes some people want to be paid by wire transfer, for instance. There, there are a lot of there are a lot of foreign artists now, and it's easy to work with foreign artists from a global standpoint these days. In fact, I work with a, I work with a couple of Russians, I work with a couple of Filipinos, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it and how they want to be paid sometimes very differs. Uh, and wire transfers can be a little expensive, so make sure you know that ahead of time, so you're factoring that mm -hmm. into your your costs. Um, uh, PayPal is obviously a constant thing. Some you know mm -hmm. there there are, are other methods as well, but clarify that up front if you can. Um, just so everybody's on the same page in terms of knowing yeah. how you're going to pay, pay them in the end. Plus uh, PayPal hits the receiver and something like that with a hefty fee. Yeah. I, so. it, it can depend. I mean, for instance, like when I, when I pay PayPal, honestly, I, I usually end up just eating the payment costs on my end mm -hmm. because it's like, it's convenient for me. I'd be paying more if I wire transferred you. So whatever, an mm -hmm. extra five bucks or something is not a big deal, but yeah, yeah the, pub the publishers add in the cost too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but you know what, you, you know, from, if you're an artist, certainly make sure you talk to them and be like, Hey, uh, uh, I'm cool with being paid on wire, wire, you know, mm -hmm. on this way, but let's figure out who's paying the cost on that transfer or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And if it's an issue, I'm usually like it, I'll usually say I'm fine with the check too, you know, yeah. <laughs> physical checks work worldwide. I've, I've, yeah. you know, I, still, I still occasionally <laughs> cut checks and send them, send them places. And yeah, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing I, I think we should mention before it, it's over is uh for artists a good resource is uh well my screen's a little dark here but the uh graphic artist skill pricing and ethical guidelines oh that's cool mm -hmm. um it's basically it's a survey it's every four or five years this one actually took a bit longer um and they basically survey people in all different art fields and find out what they're getting paid for things and they they post the list of the prices yeah, so that, that can give you an idea of what people are are charging. Speaking as a publisher, I probably should get my hands on a copy of that because that'd be useful to have. Because um, yeah, th this is uh, it comes out every like, yeah, you know, like I said, usually every three or four years. This one took I think around six or seven, mm -hmm. but it's uh, edition fifteen. Yeah, and maybe you can read this a little, a little yeah. better that I write up sometimes. Uh, or, 
Linked in the chat. There we go. Graphic there artist go. skill, pricing and school guidelines. Cool. I'm gonna actually I'm actually gonna track down a copy of that. That's that's cool. Yeah, I, cool. I backed out of the chat because it was giving me connection issues. That's but cool. uh <laughs> yeah. The um and, and the prices that, that art is paid for worldwide is very, very I mean, for instance, uh when I was working on a game at one point, um I approached a couple of artists who work in the uh in the mass market novel space. Uh and the amount they get paid in the mass market novel space is substantially higher than they get paid in the hobby game space yep uh, and I, I i and it was not i wasn't offended as a, as a publisher i was just kind of like well i'm a league gonna step back thanks guys yeah, yeah. if you if, and, honestly <laughs> whatever an artist can charge for their work is what they are worth and if you can get paid that then that's great and and that's yeah. that's cool but and um, what i like about the uh the pricing guideline there is they have different tiers of payment they have mass market they have small press they have those mm -hmm. different tiers That's great. depending on like uh, copies and worldwide reach. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I'm actually, I've never gotten a copy of that and I'm going to because that sounds like a fantastic thing to have on hand. Okay, yeah. Folks. So, so since we only have about five minutes left, I'm going to transition over to uh, just telling us uh, where we can buy your stuff if we want to go follow you elsewhere, uh, where we can follow you or contact you if we want to buy any of your things. Okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is Jack Para. Uh, you can see my name on the window, I hope. Uh, <laughs> it's P-A-R-R-A. -R -R -A, and it's just jackpara.com. You can contact me. My email's through that. My phone number's through there, too. I think I just changed over services. Mm -hmm. I may not have the phone number anymore. Um, or you can hit me on Discord, on the Discord server. I'm in the Artist Alley, or you can just private message me. And you I'm on Facebook and Jack Pyre artist and uh, Jack Pyre artist on uh, Tumblr. You're mm -hmm. still on Tumblr. Yeah. I used it as a way to post to multiple different social medias. Yeah. It's a good. It's and good. then it stopped being able to do it. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Well, you can contact me at lazanart at gmail.com. And Facebook, the fantastic art of Lizanne Lake. I'm the only Lizanne with that spelling on Facebook. So I am really, really easy to find. <laughs> so. uh, and um, uh, for my stuff, you can find our, uh, our stuff at uh, www. Excuse me. The www is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm out of myself as a Gen Xer there. It's uh, <laughs> greenroninpublishing.com uh, or atomicovermind.com is Atomic Overmind Press, my side company. Uh, and I encourage you to check out all our stuff. We make Fantasy Age, uh, Modern Age, Dragon Age, uh, Mutants and Masterminds, uh, Day After Ragnarok for Atomic Overmind Press, a couple new uh, call, uh, books for, uh, done by Kenneth Height on, um, on Cthulhu stuff, uh, Tour to Lovecraft, The Tales Expanded Edition, and Tour to Lovecraft, uh, The Destinations, which is all about Lovecraftian places and mm. essays on them. So check those yeah, out. If, yeah, if anybody needs any information also, you can uh, contact me jackpara.artist at gmail.com that's how you'll get in touch with me and as a uh, as being head of the artist alley for double exposure i have contact info for a lot of other people too so feel free to ask me or i might know someone who knows in contact stuff like that how do we get in contact with the skeleton jack <laughs> oh. <It's> his email <laughs> hey hi his name is fred, hey, fred. <laughs> available for parties i assume yeah, exactly. yep. halloween i usually put them out at the front door thank you for a very interesting panel over here great mm -hmm. so i hope you everybody listening learned something and yeah um, and if you have any additional questions, also you could uh, uh, at, at Atomic Overmind on Twitter is my uh, Twitter handle. If anybody wants to ping me there, that's where I'm probably yeah. the chattiest. Yeah, and especially this weekend, you know, just find me on on the Metatopia Discord channel. Yeah, that too. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, just click on my name; it'll at me, so it'll alert me uh, that someone's questioned something. Yep, same here. And I'm Atomic Overmind on here as well. So, all right, cool. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good panel. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> next, next time in person, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> I, I definitely hope so. Yeah. <laughs>